thank you for choosing Burnt Out Perfectionist. My name is Sarah. And my name is Eve. Guess what, everybody? I got a new microphone in time to record again. Yes, you did not listen to last week's episode. Mid-episode, my microphone decided to stop working and Eve and I had to sit awkwardly close beside each other, finish the podcast with her microphone in between the two of us. I was very close. Very close and personal that time. <laughs> yes, yeah, so and I just have the tail version of what Eve has to if the sound quality's up, uh, please let us know, because I feel like it may be a little bit better. I'm hoping so. So, Sarah. Yes. What was your Thrive of the Week? My Thrive of the Week. Um, My kid's birthday. Is that lame? That's you know, it was, it was so cheesy. She was so excited for her birthday. And she took some mini cupcakes to school. And there was lots of little things that were going on. And we went out to eat. And she was just adorable. What was your surviving moment? My surviving moment of the week. Um, Eve saving my ass to get my shift covered so I can go to my kids for a hockey tournament, which is like three and a half hours. So I was all very like, I was, child related. I was like, I was like panicking because I'm like, oh no, okay, then they have to go, then I have to prep. And it's in like a couple weeks, but I was just like, okay, I, I need like, I like me a definitive, I like me a plan. Yeah. Yes. And like, I have you. My mom was, um, and she was like, oh, we got a shift swap. And I was like, no, 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 no. Pending. I still don't know yet. Yeah. Um, are you child related though? Yeah. I'm pretty much very child related. I mean, I'm thriving with the fact that I got a new microphone brought to you by the gift Amazon gift card in which I purchased with my Telus rewards. Flip, flip. I got a teal one, which I thought was fun. Just- I got the blue Yeti um Logi or Logitech microphone. Eve has the black one. We have the exact same microphone now. Mine's just a different color. And um we love ourselves a Logitech product. So um not sponsored, but if you would like to sponsor us Logitech, oh, we would happily take that. Um I would also like to state when we first got microphones I randomly bought this one because I was like, oh, this one seems good and everybody talks about it. Easiest thing to set up in the freaking world. You plug it in, it's already set up. That's just way Sarah's was not that easy. It was a lot of modifications, which if you are gifted in the voicing stuff, good on you. Because I was like, I watched probably like five hours of YouTube just trying to figure out what the hell I was doing. (laughs) Yeah, and this took like what we sat here for like five ten minutes testing stuff, and then it was good to go. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Hazy PC lemon squeezy. Thanks, Logitech. Thank you. Again, not sponsored, but if you want to sponsor us, please go right ahead. <laughs> okay, so for today, you don't even ask me for my thrive or survive moment. Eve, what was your thrive of the week? Um, my thrive of the week was easily being able to set up your microphone. <laughs> okay. What was your survive of the week? Um, this is be a little salty. I commented on someone's video and I kind of got attacked for it. Which is so stupid because I don't even understand why you did, but I feel like a lot of people are just keyboard warriors at this point in society. So one of uh, the small businesses that I support, and I'm always very encouraging the small businesses because um, obviously we know the struggle. Yeah. Uh, on being on the struggle bit. Um, it was wanting to expand their product lines um, to other places. And I was like, oh, that's wonderful. I'd be happy to support off these places. And the like, the creator of the small business tagged my comment and then went on a rant about how, about like profits and everything. And was like, oh, I would get 100% of the profits if you bought it off my website. But um, out of distributing from like to other places, I don't. And I was like, why well, was just trying to be supportive. And then a bunch of people started being like, oh, you just don't support small businesses. And I was like, no, I just think it's a great adventure for them to have like other marketing revenues. Yeah. But yeah, I was, I was a little sad about that. So I was like, oh, I was supportive of your company. And now I feel like I just kind of got shat on for supporting other revenues. Oh, I know. Especially if they're like having a day and they like either misunderstand, but your comment didn't even have a place for there to be a misunderstanding yeah like it was so weird the video was like oh i have a meeting with this new company um to expand and distribute my products in other areas so i'm like oh okay like in canada 
very difficult for shipping and everything. And I was like, oh, that's so great. Because sometimes you have to have a minimum for certain places in order for them to keep their stock. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's wonderful. I'd love to support you. And they, I was like, it wasn't like I said, oh, I will only be supporting based off of the distributors that you have. But I'm like, I was just saying that, like, that's wonderful. It'll be more accessible for people. My my whole thing was, is I was just like, you woke up this morning and I'm like, there's more fucking comments. And I was like, just delete your comment. Just, like, delete all the things and then move on. It's so stupid. Also, like, I don't get why people get so, like, angry. Oh, people get all uppity because, um, a society is like that. You whine, you bitch, you complain, and then suddenly you're, like, viral. Well, like, I always support, I love, like, businesses that support other small businesses. Yeah. So, like, this winter, I bought a jelly box. Who, if you don't know what a jelly box is, um, it's made by Jillian Harris, who was on Love It or Listed and also knew The Bachelor. Oh, The Bachelorette. Bachelorette. The bachelor, like, a long time ago. A very long time ago. Um, And she reaches out, and, like, obviously her and her people reach out to small businesses, and it's, like, a subscription box that's quarterly, I believe. Yeah, so it's every season. Every season. Yeah. So then it gives the people who are small businesses the opportunity for you to, like, get to know them. Mm-hmm. And all also, it's all in one box. But like, she's able to use her platform to promote them. She promotes like um, all different things too. So it's like female-based businesses, small businesses. Um, she made sure that she has like some black-owned businesses that are in there as well. Um, she does fundraising for like indigenous um, folks and everything as well. Like, she does all these things for like mamas for mamas, and she promotes all that stuff. Whether it be the products or even like in the little catalog that comes with it, um, she promotes like a lot of different things, like whether it's helping people or small businesses and everything, which is great. And like we probably wouldn't have heard of most of them without seeing them like in the boxes. Like we- you got, it was like some cleaning products class. Oh my god, it was the best box in the entire world. I had never got one before, and I had someone who gave me a code. Was it you? It was me. It was you. I got a lot of codes. Yeah, so you got a code and you sent it to me and it had all of these products that I'd always wanted to try. So there was like laundry strips that were in there and um, because I have extremely sensitive skin and I have really bad allergies. So all of this stuff was in there and it was great. And then I started finding or even just like seeing the products some of them were at um, like London Drugs. They started distributing them. There was like the Nelly stuff. There's the Sting Nelly thing. Yeah. So I'm also allergic to the load. And you can get a 500 load container on Costco online. Oh, with their laundry stuff? Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, this is great. It's affordable. And then also, like, I can't use a lot of name brands because they put lavender or. Oh, there's all of the things that I have. There were so many things in that, and then I got the summer one this year, and it was super cute. It was, like, very, like, cohesive. Everything was, like, peach-themed, and I don't know. I've, I've used every single thing in the boxes, except for the summer one. I did get earrings, and my ears have grown over because I forgot to put my earrings back in, but that's, like, a me saying. That's not really, like, a them saying. They were, like, Sarah's ears grown in. How dare I send her earrings? Um, But, yeah, I'm excited about the winter one, but, like, again... A separate ways of marketing. Yeah. Different revenues and stuff like that. A little bit salty about that experience. I don't know if I'll return back because I just don't really feel like the well you did. You were literally like attacking comments and then she tagged the other person tagged your comment. So the person that she's talking about is a creator that we're not going to name and um just to make sure it's completely specified, it was not Jillian Harris. Oh my god, no. No. <laughs> it was a different creator. I will not state whether anything else other than my experience in it which made me a little sad um but today on a sad note other than my love for jillian harris and her adorable aesthetic um we want to shout about something that um actually i think it was sparked by tiktok i think it was sparked by tiktok it was sparked by like a tiktok so the main thing was is there's at least sayings and stuff like that that are out there that we almost like passively say and we don't even kind of realize what they mean or how they've kind of changed over time. And this one caught me completely off guard when I saw the video. And 
I messaged Eve and I was like, I'm going to find other ones that have either been shortened or modified. So the first one, so the one that caught my eye was the classic saying of like, oh, if say if you're at work and you're doing a million things at once and someone makes a passive comment, sometimes it's Jeff of all trades, master of none. And you're kind of like, because of uh, multitasking is seen sometimes in a negative light instead of a positive light, because it's like, well, you're probably um, doing 25% of four things, but you could do 100% of one thing. So the actual origin of that saying and the actual full version is Jack of all trades, master of none, though oftentimes better than master of one. What's the, I remember hearing Jack of trades, like, oh, you're a Jack of trades. And then I heard master of none. And I was like, oh, that's a little rude. When I heard that, I was just like, oh, that makes a lot more sense. Right. And that was the whole thing is I was kind of like, um, why does it kind of sound it, it, like you said, it sounds negative. So from the perspective of people who are neuro spicy, such as ourselves, I took that as, OK, well, my brain's always going in 18 different directions. There's something wrong with me. If someone said that, to I took it off as like a Jack of all trades, master of none. I viewed it as I was able to start a million things, but I wasn't able to complete them. Yeah. And so then that means that I couldn't, like, I'm a jack of all trades where I can pull these things out. But because I didn't put all of my focus of none I'm into it, then I can't be a master of it. But yeah, it just has this negative, like, connotation of, like, you're okay. You're okay at most things, but you're not, like, great at anything. Which it, it, exactly, and which is like another thing right now is there's a lot of people who are being completely overwhelmed in their jobs and stuff like that because other folks are being laid off and they're having to take other tasks on. And then it's like, oh, no, we're gifting you. What do they call that? Quiet promoting. Oh, my God. Quiet promoting. Yeah, quiet promoting where it's like, oh, yeah, you if this person got laid off, so you get all their duties. Do I get extra pay? No. And I get you get to cram it into your um, day that you already had crammed full of stuff. Which then follows me up with the pro- um, productivity one. The early word gets the worm. Oh, my goodness. Which the actual extended version is the early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. Which to me, when I read early bird gets the worm, we can think of all of those early, like 2016. I wake up at 5 a.m. I journal. I drink 50 glasses of water. Um, I go to the gym, I do all of these things, and then I go to work, and then I come home, and then I do another workout, and then I drink another 10 glasses of water. And all in that time, I also manage to meal prep, read three books, and go to bed by 10. I'm like, man, they must be single. My first reaction was, how? Like, there's always like this, oh, you have to get up earlier in order to do it. But that also means you need to go to bed earlier or you're not getting the proper amount of sleep. Oh, I know. Sometimes you see them like go to bed at like 9 p.m. But I know what you mean. It's like the clean girl aesthetic. It's like the me. mindful. I would say like the mindful people who are like, I get up early in the morning. I drink my coffee and I journal. I'm sorry. I get up in the morning. I go to the bathroom. I stare at the wall for 15 minutes, contemplate my life choices, go upstairs, put coffee in my travel mug because we both know that I'm not going to have time to drink it out of a mug and then manage to put myself together and somehow get out of the house. My my favorite thing about those videos is like, they're like, oh, here's me waking up. And it's like, you have mascara and makeup all over your face. Like, they're very like made up and stuff like that. It's just like a super false expectation. I know a lot of that has been debunked even by the person who used to do, the people who used to do them. Um, so for like a neurotypical person, it's like early action is often rewarded, but caution can also lead to rewards. Or a neurodiverse person may see it as early action may be rewarded, but alternative approaches can also lead to success. So you don't have to wake up at 5 a.m. In order to be a successful person in life, I wake up at 5.30 a.m. That is not by choice. I would happily wake up at like a solid 7 a.m. I would probably go for like, I usually wake up at like 6.45, 6.30. No. I wouldn't mind getting up at 6. 
But I feel like that would also mean that I would have to go to bed 30 minutes earlier. I'm also really terrible about, like, regulating my bedtime and what time I go to bed. That's the other thing. Nighttime routines. People who are like, I start my nighttime routine at 4 p.m. I'm like, that's the afternoon. They're like, I get into my pajamas. I wash my makeup off for the day. I make you three quarters meal. I'm like, dude, at four o'clock, I'm still at work. <laughs> like, I, I've had to like really deprogram myself from like what dinner is. Because I used to do that where I'd make like three to four things that would go with dinner and like really overcomplicated. And I was like, bitch, all you needed to do was like, I don't know, cook some rice, saute some veggies and make some meat. Like, yeah, like that, that's it. Or if you make twice as much, then you can take some for lunch tomorrow. Also, like these people who are like the early bird gets the worm and they wake up and they go up or like down to their kitchen and everything's clean. But they don't clean after dinner. That's my favorite about the what live happens? Yes. I know they're like, oh, okay, and everything's down. They don't show them cleaning anything. And then they wake up. I'm like, who's this? Do you have a magical night fairy? Do you have a Dobby the house elf that comes in and cleans? And then I'm like, like, how many dishes do you have? Like, do you just like, but they're like, oh, okay. Then I finish my dinner and they put the dishes in the sink. And I'm like, do you and then them right away? And they walk away. These are the questions that I have for these people. <laughs> right. Um, the next one I'll do is Carpe Diem or Seize the Day. The full version of that is, oh, watch me butcher this. Carpe Diem, Quam, Minimum, cru- Crudula, pop, Postero, or Seize the Day. Put very little, in, very little trust in tomorrow. See, I feel like this puts a negative standard on Seize the Day that you have to accomplish everything on your to-do list. Yeah. And then if you don't do it today, then you can't do it tomorrow. Like, I know people are like, seize the day you only live once. Yeah. But I'm like, I have a to-do list. Do I need to complete this? And if I don't complete it, I is a... And when I looked at that, it's like, so neurotypical would see it as seize the present moment as the future is uncertain. So like what you stated. (laughs) And neurodiverse should like reverse it and look at it as embrace the present but acknowledge the unpredictability of the future. So if you're like, I have no time to do laundry today, task paralysis, but I'm going to do six loads tomorrow, but I also have to go to the grocery store and take my kid to the hockey and do all these things. It's like, that's not really realistic. So your goal, my goal when it comes to a deal like that, to be like, I'm going to do six loads of laundry is turn over the washer once and, um, and then make sure it goes in the dryer, it gets hung up. My goal is one. If I do more than one, then I'm... Mine is, if I'm doing laundry, I do it when I have to do other things at the house. I can't do laundry when I have to leave the house. <laughs> so as soon as I leave the house, it didn't no longer exists. I know exactly what you mean. Um, The next one is, winning isn't everything. Which the extended version is, winning isn't everything. It's only thing. It's the It's the only thing. There was like, it's only thing. How? So neurotypical success is essential, but not at the expense of everything else. Neurodiverse success is highly prioritized. And there's a strong focus on achievement. Um, My perspective on this is that winning doesn't have to be the whole, like, you don't have to win. Like, you don't have to win the entire day, but you can win the minute. Mine is you can get the thing down, but it doesn't need to be perfect. And that's something that I've had to all know. I I know. No, there's certain things where I'd have to like unlearn it in order to get it done. So I'll use laundry because it's my favorite thing to talk about. What is surprise? Laundry is like I pull the stuff out mm-hmm. and I always fold my kids tops and bottoms of her pajamas into like a little like package. So I fold them. But I thought. The, yeah, I fold the pants into the shirt. And then that way, when she takes it out, she has the matching top and bottom. I've done that ever since she was little. If I see that there are several pairs of pajamas and somehow only the pants went through and I have to wait for the tops, I literally am like, I don't need to fold that basket of laundry, even though I have all of the time and I could just fold the shirts and put them aside and there's a million other things in there. I'm like, no, I should be more efficient with my time. And I think 
it needs to be perfect. I want to make sure that I can get it. I can fold them together and I can put them away. Or like the sock bin. Does anybody else hate sorting socks? Because I fucking hate sorting socks. I'm to the point of like so bad at sorting socks that I've purchased socks so I didn't have to touch the sock bin. I only buy the same sock. But I, I tried doing that. I was obsessed with these Sanctony socks that are at Costco. And then I was like, oh, I'll get another set of them. I got Sacconi. Is that what it's called? Sacconi socks? Like the ones that we both have? Yeah, the ones that have like the little padding at the top so your shoe has its hub home. And they're actually, they actually go to size 11 versus everybody else who goes to size 10. Sacconi. So want to come? Is it sa- Sanctony? My life. Oh my God. That's not a shoe brand, so that's why I know. Um, Oh, I want to do the I want to do that. Curiosity killed the cat because that has disturbed me for so many years. Girl, I was gonna no, it's curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction brought it back. The look on his face right now, like well, I'm allergic to cats, <laughs> and I never understood this one. Neither, neither I did I. Face, like, it, like curiosity killed the cat. And then I'm like, is that, like, the mystery? And, like, it's, like, a mysterious, like, the cat from Alice in Wonderland. And we're like, oh, okay, when you're curious, like, the Shashara cat, yeah. it kills the, like, idea of him because you no longer think he's real. I took it as don't be a nosy bitch. Yes, but why would it kill a cat? I don't know. So when I when I was doing my research, which this is rare. Usually we just come in with a topic and like roll with it. But I was like, I want, I want to have like, I, I, I started with that one and then go. So neurotypical excessive curiosity can lead to trouble, but can also be rewarding. Neurodiverse excessive curiosity can have negative consequences, but finding answers can be satisfying. Like, I feel like when it's like curiosity killed the cat, I'm like, oh, is it because cats have nine lives? And that kills one of your lives. Yeah. And then satisfaction brings it back. And like at the same time. Why are you putting weight on killing an animal? No, I know. So it's like, um, we can use like all those people online who are like, well, I think my boyfriend's cheating on me. So I'm going to look through his phone. Then you find out that he is. And it's all right there in front of you. And you're satisfied that you found the answer, but you're also completely devastated. Is the best example. So, like, of- could be fine. We gotta think of it. Oh, I don't even use that phrase because I never understood it. I thought it was so stupid. I feel like only, like, the Matt Hatter could say that. Curiosity killed the cat. Yeah, it's very much like a Johnny Depp vibe. Yeah. Um, the next one is great minds think alike, which extended our great minds think alike, although fools seldom defer. I love how you just said that and then stared at me i'm like well I'll do that we literally sit across from each other i can breathe out the other ones oh no i was just like neurotypical shared ideas indicate intelligence and differences suggest a lack of wisdom or neurodiverse shared ideas might sig- signify commonality but differences are typical and not necessarily indicative of foolishness the fact that I could say those words and not say the fucking brand name right at Costco is hilarious. <laughs> My, when I hear great minds think alike, yeah. I feel like it was commonly said to me by people who pissed me off. Always oh, like a condescending thing. Like it was like a group project vibe. Like, oh, like I'll like suggest an idea and then they'll be like, oh, great thing. Great minds think alike. And I'm like, I did all of the work. Like, yeah. that's not great minds think alike because you didn't think of it. See, and I've always seen it as great minds think alike when you're, like, on the same, like, wavelength as somebody. Where it's, say, I was doing I, I was doing something or talking to Jen about something. Mm-hmm. And I was just, like, not saying it to her, but she's, like, messaging me about, like, holiday dresses one mm-hmm. night. And I'm looking through all this stuff and I was like, mm, well, if she gets something that's super holiday, then she can't really reuse it unless it's like for another holiday. So why should she get something that's super useful? Next voice note from her is, well, I want to make sure that I get something that's super versatile that I can reuse again and dress up and dress down as needed. 
That is, I see as great minds think alike. But that's what I always thought. Would you ever say that out loud? Great minds think alike? I, I've said that to her, her, Morgan, and you. Oh. You've always been like this. Ew. No, because everybody is different in their own personalities and stuff. And why are we trying to sum everybody up that we're like, oh, great minds think alike? No, my mind is a mess. You don't want my mind. Like, it's also used as, like, I've seen a lot of people use it in, like, a negative context. Like, what you're saying, like, say if there's two people talking and they support one specific political party and then one other person sitting there who supports a different party, they'll be like, hmm. well, gray minds think like now, don't they? I know. And it's... you're like... I always think, too, like, I have a huge issue when people, when somebody comes in and they have this fantastic idea and everybody, instead of going, like... Okay, so and so had amazing idea that branched off into these. They're always like, "How oh, great minds think alike." No, this person put so much effort in. <laughs> Can you tell I have group project trauma? I was like, "You have group project trauma." I'm gonna go back to one of the ones that I skipped over because I wanted to do the like, curiosity. It's the winter one. Yeah. Now is the winter of our discontent. Extended is actually. Now is the winter of our discontent. Make glorious summer by the sun of York. It's got to be some phrase from something else. I was trying to find it. I feel like that's like a Shakespeare thing. The neurotypical translation is times of unhappiness can be followed by better times. While the neuro spicy is challenging periods can be transformed into brighter ones with the right factors. From my knowledge of this, York is an English. Yeah. So, from my understanding, it would be like, you know, it's really rainy and like sad. Yeah. In winter. But in summer, it's like bright and happy. Yeah, it also rains. So, it's more like, no, but it's like a nice summer. Yeah. It's like a transformation of like the environment is the same, but some like the light has just gotten brighter. So, that's like your optimism. Oh my God. Every single time I read like the original one that you see, if you read like winter disconnect, it, I was like, that's got to be about seasonal affective disorder. Oh, I just thought it meant, like, all of the people that were like, oh, thank God, I don't have to go to the beach anymore. Like, you know, envision, like, you know, and they're like, oh, my God, those things were, like, women wear corsets. And then it's like, the summers for disconnect. I just thought of somebody, like, disconnecting your corset. And they're just like, Ugh. I love that you went for a corset. And I immediately think I was, like, putting a hoodie on and, like, pulling my bra out my sleeve. Very similar. It's like, mine is more like visual. this century. <laughs> um, people are wearing corsets now. I don't because my boobs. Yeah, but they wear them and they call them shirts. I'm so confused. It's very like I think it's because I just go straight to Easy A. That's the first thing I think. Okay, true. Next one, money is the root of all evil. It stands for us for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The neurotypical translation. Money can lead to various wrongdoings, while the neurospicy is its excessive desire for money, not money itself, that causes problems. That's a, that's exactly it. Like, that's how I've actually always read that, is, like, when someone says that money is the root of all evil, is, like, it's not that. It's what people do to get it. I think that, like, for me, when I read, like, money is all cause of evil, it's the, like what you use that money for so a lot of people will of course say like oh you should use it for an arrangement of things without knowing people's circumstances so they're like when you get money you become evil but it's like not actually the physical person who gets money sometimes it's the reaction for other people oh my goodness like all those people do you remember that show about the people who won the lotto yes and like how it completely ruined their lives and they're like, oh my god, everybody, like, people would sue them and all that stuff. So it's like, to me, money opens up the conversation of, like, entitlement and selfishness. Like, if you think about when someone dies, there's some, like, some family member's immediate reaction is, oh, well, like, what money am I getting? Sometimes even if their significant other is still alive, they say that. Yeah, like, what money am I getting? Yeah. How much money can I get? Yeah. I'm sorry. Are you not, like, worried about the actual person? Well, like, how am I supposed to survive? Why are you immediately turning to, like, a piece of plastic or a piece of paper versus, like, the physical person? My whole thing is, like, I always try to keep it, like, very straight with 
my kid and I say this all the time is like money is a made up thing money yeah you have to use it to pay for things and it's in society but money is not the end all of the all of life and like money can buy the staples and money can also buy things that ruin your life yeah it's still the choice first and the money second because you've made the decision to spend the money yeah so i would almost say that it's like decisions it is decisions and like you said there always ends up being other factors it's like oh okay well i want this and then it's like oh okay well you have that well you better make sure you you use it properly you utilize this properly or you utilize that money properly and it's like well what's what's saying that that person needs to use it what's proper to you and why do you think you have a say in somebody else's money like the entitlement of like oh you have money my favorite is i've like witnessed people who um i was friends with and stuff and they were like oh oh my god my grandmother's just like burning through her money there's gonna be none left for us when she dies she fucking earned that your grandpa who was with her fucking earned it Mm -hmm. it's not your fucking money why do you care when someone dies, honestly, I don't give a fuck what I get. I don't know why people are like, oh my god, I, well, like, they were had millions of dollars, so, like, I am entitled to my, why? Why are you entitled? Or I love when, I love when all those millionaires just, like, donate all their money to charities and their kids just lose their shit. And I'm like, well, what have you been doing the last four years? So, yeah, Clay, also, like, if you wanted said money, why aren't you trying to build a business where to, like, I bet you have a family member that had a bunch of money would want to support you in that. Yeah. And then, because at the end, they're, like, all sitting there, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, what do I get? And it's, like, this, what? It's so ridiculous. Speaking of family, um, blood is thicker than water. The extent it is. The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. I love that you use watering face. Which also so, makes me laugh is the fact that, like, blood when it comes out and water, like, sometimes have the same. Yeah, it depends thing. on the person's, like, freaking vitamin, vitamins, hydration, um, clot count. Yeah. All of the things. They're like, blood is thicker than water. And I'm like, well, I've seen some thick water and I've seen some thin blood. Yeah, right? So, like, neurotypical is family bonds are stronger than other relationships. Um, neurospicy is stronger bonds can form through chosen connections, not just family. I feel like it's neurotypical people about rap, though. I know. I feel like it's all. I I feel like that's not based on that. Again, this was like research and stuff like that. But I feel like that's based on what relationship you've had with your family base. To be totally honest, and say if you had like a really shitty family situation. That you're going to judge it based on, like, bonds and choose closer connections that may be, like, fa- um, friends that you consider family. Or you may some maybe somebody who has a mixture of both who puts family, um, like, has family and friends kind of, like, on the same level and thinks of them in the same way. Or certain friends and stuff like that. I think that's a very, like you said, it's, a, like, a very specific thing. A lot of... um people too when i was looking into this would relate this back to like um religion and then um like based on what you were able to like contribute and stuff like that i was like man there are so many different like because you get a saying and people take it a million different ways or apparently just cut it in half i feel like a lot of these like you have the shorter version that make it seem kind of negative and then with the extended versions it has like additional context and depth yeah and, like, the interpretations can obviously depend on, like, the person's perspective and their personality and everything. But I feel like it's, like, the embodiment of, like, you know in English class when they're, like, write an essay and you're, like, why did I get this wrong? And it's, like, well, I interpreted it differently. Oh, my God. Well, we're, like, God damn it. So it's, like, I feel like all of these quotes are just the embodiment of the English language and the English. Oh, they totally are. Like, they're completely, can like confusing first off when you make other folks read these well when and my to... confusion we've broken down into five separate segments yeah um misinterpretation so people who are neurospicy might interpret common sayings or idioms more literally or differently from neurotypical individuals 
For example, if a neurodiverse person takes the early bird gets the worm, literally, it can lead to misunderstandings or the interpretation of like XYZ. That's the best representation of like a person I can think of is when people would say these like sayings to like Sheldon in Big Bang Theory. And if he hadn't heard of the specific one or if it was more like a slang version of it, he would either tell them the full definition of what the saying was and kind of go through it with them to explain it to them and how they were using it out of context. Or he would just turn and look at them and be like, what do you mean? Like, and it, like you said, it would usually sound negative. Um, the next would be like social expectations. So there's often like social expectations to like understand and use idioms and common sayings like correctly. So when neuro neurodiverse individuals don't conform to these specific expectations, um, then they can be perceived as like not understanding um their social cues it's like language and stuff like that so it'll be like oh well the early bird doesn't get the worm and you feel like someone's shitting on you because say you have a make your own shift program and you start at 11 a.m because that's the best for you your body because you're a giant night owl and you need to stay up and that's how it works maybe for the stimulant that you take or anything like that and it's like well you didn't get up at 6 a.m. like the rest of us and start work, so you suck. And it immediately comes in with like that negative kind of because as it's been stated time and time again, the world is the world and the expectations are generally built for neurotypicals. Even though I feel like there are way more neurospicy people, I also feel like I don't like it's a trending thing. Yeah, to be easy. Like, I saw this one thing, which might be slightly controversial, but I don't really think so. Is um, this person went on and they were like, I um, I had this job interview and I asked to talk, stop, like, to come in at different times based off of, like, time blindness in the morning. Oh my God, I saw this girl's video. And everybody in the comments is like, what are you talking about? She goes, well, like, if I wake up late, like, I shouldn't be like penalized for that and so everybody's like oh okay so you would stay that extra time over and she goes no i'm off at the time that does it or like i'm like and then they're like oh, okay do you shorten your like your breaks and she's like no and i'm like i'm so lost on how like if we like x there's a difference between like task paralysis or being late because of like something else that's going on but if you have an agreement that you're supposed to start at 8 and you started a contract that started at 8, mm -hmm. then you should be at work at 8. I remember that watching that video and being like, I don't think she understands what time blindness is. Like, there's a difference between time blindness and not waking up at the right time. Yeah, so there's like time blindness, for those of you who do not experience it, is at least my definition is, I will state because I am not a professional um mine is like okay so i got up i started doing laundry doing a bunch of stuff and then i started reading a book and i was doing all these things and next thing i know it's 1 30 in the afternoon and i'm like where the fuck did the day go it's not having any um conscious like time clock or like when you hyper focus yeah and it's like three hours later that's different than oh well like i feel like my um employer should cater to whatever time i decided to show up for work but i still want to get paid the same and i still want to do this and everybody else's day is being pushed back being like which is also like when people depend on you to do things you're way more likely to do them but yeah adhd um but you're now putting other people in poor perspectives because like you didn't set your alarm yeah. And like, yeah, everybody has those days or like when it's snowy or like the car breaks down and stuff like yeah. that. Totally makes sense. But if you're consciously showing up every day, later and later, or at various different times because you feel like your sleeping patterns are more important than other people's, then like, yeah, unless you have like something very specific, like car breaks down. Um, there was something that happened last night and stuff like that. Like, then just call in sick. You could also just like have a conversation instead of being that person who's chronically late or whatever. Just be like, hey, is there an opportunity for me to start at a different time that may work better for me? And if they say no, well, at least you asked. The worst thing that they're going to say is no. 
Well, and then you can find it. You can take a job that would accommodate for that. Yeah. And then as somebody who was, like, really willing to start at whatever time, take that job. I know. I, I remember watching that and I was like, what the heck? I'm like, I do not understand what this person means. Um, I thought of something else and I cannot remember. Um, uh, challenges in social situations. So neurodiverse individuals might have difficulty navigating social situations with idioms and common phrases. So that kind of leads to like Sheldon is what I always think of. Sheldon, but also like I feel like that's very strong suited to when people are from other countries and like you know how in America they call like pop um coke in some country in some province states and then um or soda or they call them like different things yeah so it's not that like you're incapable of knowing it you're just like what does that mean um that was like when i was little and i was in kindergarten and they were someone was like oh what was something that you did and i was like oh i went with my nana which a lot of kids at that time called their grandparents like grandma and grandpa so there was the first thing that kind of made people make a face and i was like I went with her to the mall and we went to the lift to the second floor and I was talking all the way through. So our grandmother's from England Mm -hmm. and there were certain things that I would say all the time, like knickers for my underpants or whatever. And people just look at me like, that's weird. Why are you talking like that? I'm like, is it weird to me? I don't understand. My number one is um, the thing that you change the channels with. Everybody else calls them like there's a chat. It's like a channel. Channel changer. Channel changer. Remote. Our family has always called them a clicker. Yes. Because you click the button. Yeah. And it's like some people, it does make you feel dumb when people pause and they look at you like you have an alien, like you're an alien. And you're like, I'm sorry. I just called something slightly different than what it is. That's like, um, I, funny things to like relate it back to because I ended up saying this. My daughter had grown out of, and it's like, I'm going to explain it very literal. It's like overalls, but instead of pants, it's a skirt, and it's made out of plaid fabric. So I call that a jumper. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's like the jumper. The company that we purchased the uniform stuff from calls it a tunic. I know. A tunic to me is like a long shirt. And then the person who I got it from called it overall shorts or something. And I was just like, to me, that's like the literal beauty of it. And then I call it dumb grease. <laughs> that's the whole thing is there's so many different ways or like people will say like jumpsuit. Like there's obviously there's like a million of those things out there. But I was just like, that's so funny. I remember saying one of those like this week. Another big one is stereotyping. So misunderstanding can lead to stereotypes or misconceptions about neurodiverse individuals, such as being overly literal or not getting jokes. Which I immediately thought of, you know, when somebody says the thing and you like minorly, like you're like, oh, that was kind of rude. And they're like, oh, I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. And you're like, excuse me? Oh, this is not a backpedal moment. There's there's that or there's the way. So this happens a lot to this would happen a lot to me in high school when people would talk about like. It would be like sexual or inappropriate things. Is I would be like, what? I would just sit there and stare at them. And they're like, what? And I'm like, well, what is this? This happened a lot too when I was playing, um, I started playing Cards Against Humanity. Mm-hmm. Also, um, note to self, if you're listening to this and you maybe had a more, I don't want to say wholesome, but say like maybe you weren't just like, into finding out all the slang terms for things and you're not um, an avid urban dictionary user to look things up, um, don't Google the things on the Cards Against Humanity cards if you don't know what it is. Just play it one time when it says something and other people who know what it is will make a face and be like, oh, don't Google it. You can't unsee it. The look on your face. See, I also grew up like, we played like apples to apples, which is like, the clean version of the original call it um cards against humanity but i'm also like can you just have like a little booklet that has the definition of these things inside of it Mm -hmm. Uh, ways that we could improve right um 
And like the whole point of this is to address the challenges and encourage better communication. Yeah. And don't say random things that mean other things. Like God's sakes, we already speak English where you read, 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 and read. There's read the color, there's read a book, and that's I read it past tense. Oh, my kid's favorite is all the different there's. There, there, there. Yeah, she goes, oh. And that we're like giving her all the different things. She's just like, trace me nuts. I'm like, I know. Or light and light. Light as in weight or light as in bright, light. bright, bright light. So many of them piss me off. Or died and died. Like I dye oh. hair and someone has died. I know. Why? Why? Why do we just unpick a different term? I know. And there's oh, the ones I used to have a, a hard time like spelling when I was a kid was like dessert and desert. Because they were like similar but not. Oh, because I read it as um, desert is sandy, says one S. And dessert has two S's because they're super sweet. That's how I learned them. Oh. That reminds me of, you know, that reminds me of, um, I had the hardest time remembering how to spell Saskatchewan when I was a kid, which is the province in Canada. And um, I had the hardest time and you had to like memorize the spelling of each province and the capital city for said province. And it's like when I say New Brunswick, I call it New Brunswick. So I remember how to spell it properly. Uh Oh, you're looking at me here. Anyway. Brunswick? Yeah. As New Brunswick? Yeah. Because that was the closest way that I could associate it to remember. How well, I was like, are you spelling burn wrong? <laughs> no. Um, but the thing that she taught me to say, her, it was Alicia's mom that I grew up with, is she said, Sam, so you take the letter of each word that I'm about to say. Mm-hmm. Sam and Sally kiss at the Cherry Hotel every Wednesday at night. And you take the first letter of it, and that's how you spell Saskatchewan. The other one that I always did, but I don't know if Sarah remembers this. I, whenever we would learn the months of the year, like in kindergarten, I learned it to the Macarena. So whenever somebody would play the Macarena, I was like, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, October, October, November, December. Hey, what's the year? That's how I learned it. And then everybody else was singing the Macarena and I was like, what is this? Um, the saying that I never actually fully understood, but did the whole, I'm going to pretend that I know what people are saying and that's how I'll understand, was the one for how many days are in each month of the year. But you learn the knuckles thing. I learned the 30 days past September, April, June, and November. All the rest have 31. So well, she does this knuckle thing. You put your, so you put your two hands together. Yeah. You start on your left hand. If you have a knuckle, there's 31 days. If there is no knuckle, it's. Less than 30 days. So January, knuckle. February, no knuckle. March has 31. April has, doesn't. May has 31. June does not. July does. August does. September does not. October does. November. Well, and that's the funny thing. It's like, like, so they used to say that saying all the time. And I would be like, yeah. And I would still just look it up. Like, I was just like, okay, whatever. And then it finally clicked when I was older. And I was like, oh, my God, that actually makes sense. I turned and looked at my husband and said, I finally realized this. And I explained it to him. And he looks at me and he goes, I've been trying to figure that shit out for like 36 years. And I looked at him and I went, oh, my God. He goes, yeah, like there's certain things like where I've just been like, oh, yeah. Or like the joke that you don't get, but you laugh at it anyways. I usually zone out when people are telling jokes, so I just don't. My my favorite is when I tell a joke and you laugh, and I can tell by your laugh if you understood it, if you thought it was dumb, or if you were like, okay, I'm going to laugh because that's what she wants me to do right now. No, because she do this face where like her eyes are slightly wider, and she's like, what do you call a fake noodle? And then makes direct eye contact with me, and it's like all of my social anxiety comes at the same time, and I'm like, and then pasta and then i don't want to ruin it for her and like say it because i know that she wants to say the punchline and they do the same thing to her child <laughs> and i'm like oh my god i have no idea what it is and she's like and pasta and she's dying of laughter and i'm like he and i'm like damn it you already knew that one didn't you it's, it's just, um but to encourage better communication encourage open be oh encourage open 
Encourage communication. Nerdwise individuals should feel comfortable asking for clarification when idioms or sayings are used. Promote understanding and acceptance of neurodiversity. I'm just going to sideball it. If someone doesn't understand something and they don't have a dash of the spicy, d- just explain it to them. I, I just feel like just just treat everyone equally and don't tell someone they're dumb or make fun of them for not understanding what it is. Because everybody grew up a different way. And there's a lot of things that people don't know or that are not common sayings, such as a saying that our father used to say all the time. Porcupine humping a football. Yeah. Oh, my God. You look like a porcupine humping a football, which means you look so uncomfortable. It's like the and sit on you with a stick up your ass. Yeah. Or piss up the rope and suck on the wood end. Yeah. And a lot of people are like, what? And I'm like, and it. the best part is that sometimes it just completely dumbfounds people who are being jackasses if you say that to them. But also, people are like, what? Which, like, essentially, it's just to re- recognize and embrace everybody and, like, support communities. And, like, we're not saying get rid of fun sayings. But if you have somebody who just blank stares at you, like, what just came out of your mouth, maybe, like, explain it a bit more. Like, I've had to explain things and I'll be like, oh, can you hand me the clicker? And, like, one of my friends is like, sorry? And I'm like, the clicker. And yeah. they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, the fast thing. The other thing I can relate it to is say if you make a, um, you find the perfect time to say a quote from a movie, then that person's ever seen that movie and they just look at you blank. Like when they come up to you with a blue hat on and glass, sunglasses, maybe. She doesn't even go here. Yeah, that's my immediate reaction. Or like when, um, when someone's trying to like make something cool or be like everybody else is doing it then i will literally yell stop trying to make fetch happen and they're like what or i'll replace fetch with like whatever they're trying to like whatever their agenda is that they're trying to push um the number one that i always feel like people don't remember if it's always really sad is sometimes i'll be like i'm just standing and then our series go in front of a boy asking him to love her and the amount of people that blank stare at you and you're like, do you not understand this rom com classic? Oh, yeah. Or like, I'm an autumn. Ooh. Did you forget? Not a dude. Do you? The Gilmore Girls thing. There's so many different things that, like, if, if you want to go for sayings that people have no idea of understanding or they sound like they're speaking a different language, if you watch Gilmore Girls, I feel like Lorelai is the perfect definition of that. The stuff mm-hmm. that comes out of her mouth half the time, they're like, what? She's like, you know, from blah, blah, blah. And they're like, what? My one of my favorite quotes and RIP Mr. Matty Perry is um I'm not so good at advice, but can I interest you in a sarcastic comment? Okay, I love that. And every time I see it, I'm like mood. There's so many little like Chandlerisms that we're always getting. Yes. I also realize the amount of times that we move furniture and the amount of times I have to yell, Hey that I don't think your husband has your husband seen friends. Oh my god, so he has it. So he finally okay. turned and looked at me. I want to say about six months ago, I was talking about something and he turns and looks at me and goes, I'm so sorry. I have never watched that show. So I had to move. I don't even remember when I was moving with him. And I said, pivot. And he put it down and he looked at me and he was like, why are you yelling at me? And I'm like, I was like, and he, what? Am I pivot? And he goes, are you mad at me? And I'm like, oh my God, What? <laughs> There's certain things that are like pop culture things that he doesn't have that he didn't have or whatever because he also didn't have cable. We had like a lot of free air channels, but we lived closer to the border. So like I saw a lot more things than what he did. There was some other joke I made the other day from like a 90s kid show and he just looked at me and I was like, he didn't watch that one, did you? So there no spy. And everything, every time he says, I need to go get my PSL. I can go to small pumpkin spice and I'm like, sugar, but everything nice. And he like blank stares at me. And I'm like, how do you not have seen? Right. And that's the whole thing is there are certain things where there's always those like funny things that happen. But he knows now not to just laugh because I turn to look at him and go, you didn't know what I just said. And he'll go, no. And I'm like, can you I'm say like, I have no idea? And he'll like smile and be like, I don't know what you're talking about. So we're going to end today's episode. Do, do, do with um i'm gonna give eve some rapid fire questions oh god go rapid ish okay i'll get with some questions and then eve will ask me some questions and we'll do our usual thing okay 
What's one piece of advice you received that had a significant impact on your life? Um, actually, I said this to somebody that I worked with recently. Our father once said before he died um, that when someone dies, it's the cocoon dying, not the butterfly. So why are you mourning a shell instead of the butterfly that flies on? Mm-hmm. And then when people go, well, aren't you crying about the butterfly? But the ba- butterfly continued traveling. And I just thought it was a good piece of advice. It is so cute. It was like, oh, or never let the fear strike you out keep you from telling the shell. Yeah. Babe, roof. Yeah. Um, could you share a memorable experience from your career in healthcare that taught you an important lesson? Just because you're having a bad day once you leave your room, when you enter a room, doesn't mean that you need to make that person have a bad day. That's a good one. So I saw this one TikTok thing that was like, um, I was like a nurse, like a patient had died in the next room. She was like, good morning, Fox and Friends. And people were like, that's insane that that's the expectation. But at the same time, like, the patient doesn't know what else is going on. So if you really just fake it and you act like it's a different thing, like it's Groundhog Day, Mm -hmm. then they're more likely to feel better. But if you're like, oh, my God, this world sucks then, like, they're probably not going to want you. <laughs> That's very true. And because we only have three questions, I want to skip to the last one. Um, What's a hobby or interest you have that might surprise our listeners? Of this moment, we always have different hobbies. I was like, I'm a lot of random hobbies. Um, Oh, watercolor. A calligraphy? I was going with watercolor. I Watercolor and motion. Uh, she was, like, waving a paintbrush in the air, and I was like, I don't know what this is. Oh yeah, I know oh, I'm dis it's the it's Disney. Do 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 Um I recently reopened my love of watercolor because I realized that um a lot of the prints that I was wanting for my room didn't match the color scheme that I wanted. Mm-hmm. So I picked up some watercolors and decided I would learn how to do it. Um and then now Sarah is like, We gotta put on a phone case, I want it on a phone case. And my past like, oh, those are cute. Are those for over one the label? And she's like, no. I can't put it off. She goes, they're just for me. But sure, I can scan them and put them on for a phone case. I was like, sweet. Like, I have fall ones in right now. And then I have, um, I've done quite a few winter ones. And then the funny thing was, is I started watercoloring more. And my friend at work was like, hey, can you make favor tags? Can you make table time? I'm like, sure. And she was like, okay, I don't know if Kirk knows how to do it. I'm like, oh, it's okay. And I brought them in the next day. And she goes, when the hell did she learn how to watercolor? And I was like, I don't really know. It just kind of happened. Um, Sarah. Yes. As a millennial mom, what's one parenting lesson or moment that stands out to you as a as particularly valuable? Okay, so we always worry about our kids being, like, independent. Mm-hmm. And we don't want them to be dependent all the time, especially as they get older. So this this week that's one thing i've always strived and like worried about Mm -hmm. is like am i making sure that she's an independent person am i making sure that she knows how to do things herself or i always worry about being kind of like overbearing well this week i was like i scheduled her for a dentist appointment and there is no time to come get me so my husband has had he just changed careers And his job that he had previously had very restrictive hours, so he never really had a chance to go to appointments. So I would be the flexible person kind of making things happen, generally with our mom or with our wonderful neighbor, Donna. And um, I was like, okay, so you're taking her to the dentist. And as we were, after we dropped her off, I'm like, okay, so she doesn't really like a lot of the Tayshia raspberry last time. She didn't really like it when it came to the polishing thing. Like if she has a wiggly tooth right now, if they ask if she wants to pull it out, that is not your your question to answer. That is her question to answer. Like, just making sure that he kind of, like, understands because she's very, like, routine-based. And he has a tendency to fly off the wheel and kind of do things. So I was setting those expectations. And he got all excited and prepped himself and, like, called me and double-checked everything. And I sent everything in for the insurance. And he goes to walk in with her, gets up. They say, it's time for your appointment. And he goes to get up and walk, and she turns around, put her hand up, and goes, I can do this now by myself because I'm seven, because it was her birthday this week. 
And my husband was like, oh, okay. And he goes, I sat down and I was like, my God, she's an independent little girl. And he goes, I was so proud of her and so excited. But also I was like, oh my God, my baby girls. And he sent me that like crying, smiling emoji. And then he sent me the context of what that was for. And I was like, of course, when you take her, it was an easier experience. Um, We have discussed our clothing brand over on the label in the past, our business. What is the most rewarding part of being involved in an adventure such as the business? And I'll also go switch it up and say, what is the most frustrating thing about being a part of a business? Okay. If all the platforms could uniformly get together and decide on one aspect ratio that you want for pictures, that would be fucking great. Because, for example, if you're posting content, Instagram stories, Instagram posts, and Instagram reels are all different formats and aspects. I have also figured out that Instagram reels are the same size as a Pinterest pin, which can also be the same size as a TikTok video. Which is great. But that was not discovered months ago. (laughs) No, and the other thing was, is I was um, doing some, like, extra work on her website. And there was, like, obviously, you know, for, like, banners and icons, stuff like this. But I was setting up the brand kit in our Shopify store. And I was just, like, okay, I'm sitting there uploading the logo. I look and it's, like, red. It says it needs to be this by this. I was like, okay, download it. I go to another section. It needs to be this by this. Okay. And this is within the brand kit. I was like, okay, whatever. Two different ones. Then I go through each of the individual sales channels. So this is not specific to Shopify. This is um, at Google, Facebook, and Instagram when you're setting up stuff. And Linktree. They all needed a different fucking thing. I literally had like... 15 different versions of our logo on my desktop. I was so annoyed. That's very annoying. It was, it's, and the whole thing is that you're like, oh, I'll just do a couple things. And then those couple things that would probably take like 15 to 20 minutes if you could reuse and do things a certain way, they take you like two and a half, three hours. What, on a soft side, what is the most rewarding slash best part of being? Um, what I love is like being able to have stuff that we actually want, which I know sounds kind of generic, but what I mean by that is like, I have been dyslexic since I was younger and diagnosed as dyslexic and it was always seen as kind of, in some cases seen as like kind of like a shameful thing instead of like, oh, you just learn differently. Um, and now I can have like a definition on the shirt and Um, one of the moms at school I wore to like the barbecue and stuff like that she's like oh I saw your shirt that's so cute I'm like thanks she goes is that one of the ones that you made I'm like yeah it is and I could say proudly that from start to finish I made the image and the definition and all the other stuff that was on it it wasn't like I just took a template and threw different things or I found it somewhere else and then um, just being able to like proudly ironically label myself but in a positive manner instead of a negative manner um, final question. What's a book, movie, or TV show that has left a lasting impression on you and how has it influenced your perspectives on life or parent? Um, I love friends, obviously. Like there's so many different funny things that comes or come around it and things that they make fun of. Um, there's I, I want to say when it comes to parenting, oh, what's one that I like quote all the time? I would say Gilmore Girls. Just like the playful aspect of like, instead of just screaming or addressing things at your kid, I'll be like, well, we could have made a better life choice now, couldn't we? Thank you for listening. If there's any other fun things that you know, either secret meanings of or extended meanings of and stuff like that, please throw them in the comments below. And please know that you can find us on YouTube, Instagram, Pinterest, TikTok. What am I missing? Facebook. Facebook. But yeah. So um thank you so much for your time and hopefully we made you laugh and stay as warped and twisted as ever. Peace.